Most of you have li listened to most of what I'm going to say during the course of the next 30 minutes, <clears throat> but like a good lecturer, I think it is important that you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them, and then you ask them what you told them. And I know most of you very well by the name, and I'm going to ask you afterwards what I said. So please listen carefully, please focus, and make sure you know and you understand what I'm going to say. When I walked onto the stage, I realized that I'm entering the so-called twilight zone of my professional career. And as such, uh, me and my contemporaries are rather hesitant to change. But not because we don't want to change, but merely because we don't like to change to something that is tainted with politics. And most of these deals that we are going to talk about, some of them are, are proposals, have got a taint of politics involved in there. What are these deals that we are talking about? First of all, the EU Green Deal, of course, we've heard a lot about the EU Green Deal, we've heard a lot, and you will even hear much more from specialists in this regard. But then also, and something that is concerning me a lot, is the South African regulatory authorities and, uh, uh, aim to scrap the registration and the use of certain substances of concern. These are compounds classified as 1A, and I've put it in brackets, 1B, and I've done it specifically because there's an element of unclearness, of un, un, uh, lack of knowing exactly what is being meant by all of this. And this is all taken from the initial draft regulation that was published a few months ago by the registrar, where he, where he gave his intention to scrap certain of these registrations. And then, of course, he also mentioned so-called substances identified by the Stockholm Convention, A, B, and D. That was according to the draft regulation. Subsequently, there was a letter that was shown by Sara, which indicated that he's also want to scrap some stuff under the, um, under the uh, Rotterdam Convention, I think, Sara, of the other one, the Montreal Convention, whatever conventions there was. N needless to say, when we look at these things, it is of great concern. Can we comply or can we not comply? I think Rod alluded to the IPM principles that are being followed by CropLife or that are being endorsed by CropLife. And yes, in horticulture, and I would refer to the horticultural side of things mainly, in horticulture we've already adopted this whole concept of IPM many, many years ago. For those who have forgotten about it, just as a reminder, it has this philosophy has a few specific aims in mind. First of all, it must pr support the production of class one fruit profitably. It's no use in producing a load of rubbish in the end of the day under the auspices or under the umbrella of IPM because it cannot sell. And if you don't sell, you, uh, you have quite a bit of a problem and Andre would, would uh, be able to explain to you if you don't know what that is. Secondly, it must create space and opportunity, and I would like to be very specific about that, create the space and the opportunity for natural enemies and biological control agents to proliferate and assist in, not replace, but assist in the control of pest and diseases using conventional chemistry. And the ARs that I've used there is agricultural remedies, by the way. Furthermore, uh, the focus must be to develop local and site-specific beneficial organisms. I have a little bit of a problem with imported products that are being supplied from a bottle, with due respect. Another aim of IPM is, of course, the, the uh, delay or the prevention of, the, of uh, resistance. That is most probably one of the main aims of IPM, is to prevent or delay resistance as such. We are running out of suitable alternatives or active ingredients much faster than we can replace them, and I think it was shown on some of the graphs this morning. The control strategies that we follow must be nice to the environment. In other words, agricultural remedies, when used judiciously, are not necessarily bad. They can assist and they can do a very good job provided that you use them judiciously. ARs must be palatable, uh, uh, must have a palatable mammalian toxicity profile, Humans can run and hide, but naturals cannot hide. Furthermore, I would emphasize the ideal crop protection strategy. What does it look like, bearing in mind what we just heard about IPM? It must therefore be effective. It must follow an acknowledged science-based approach for diagnosis and prescription. 
Chosen compounds must have a short but functional decline life or decline curve. It must be site-specific or target-specific. It must be safe to the biotic and, and abiotic environment, and there must be plenty of alternatives available, otherwise we cannot uh, uh, protect resistance development. That are that, are speci or that has the same efficacy on the, on the target, but with different modes of action. Yeah, I just realized that I'm using the computer and not, and not your clicker. Is it fine? Have you managed to, to bridge that gap? Thank you very much for intelligent people. Okay. that <coughs> The, um, okay, back to the, the ideal crop protection strategy. Compounds and strategies must be safe to the crop, of course. It's also no good to spray chemistry and fix the, the problem, but you increase the, the you, you destroy the crop. It must comply with legal standards of the country of origin. Therefore, it must be registered, and it must be used within the GAP set by the country of origin, or set by the label must comply with the requirements of the local and international buyers. So your crop protection strategy must be in, in harmony with what the buyer wants eventually. And I'm mentioning this, and as Alan was alluding earlier, there's a, there's a level of logic involved in what I want to say, because I'm moving towards an, uh, the, the practical impact of some of these chemicals that we have, and you will see that there are conflict with regards to these issues that we've just said, said to each other and most probably agreed about. Okay, before we go any further, I think it is important to just mention that we do not know what exactly gave rise to the decision of the registrar and what all the reasons are for the decisions that have been taken. It is also unclear which products are to be phased out. I think Sarah alluded to that when she said, we are still in the process of trying to find out which products are con of our concern. Whether the registrar is going to accept the motivation for extended use is also unclear to us, but we are trying. We're going to spend a lot of time putting forward alternatives or debates as to why a certain compound should stay and others cannot, do not have to stay, and whether that will be acceptable or not, we don't know. We also do not know whether he will allow for the quicker and time is registration of alternatives, if they are available. We are also not certain that there will be available replacements for these pro products that we lose. And when we lose them, we don't have time to replace them. It must be done immediately. It must be done very short, on a very short notice. So most probably it would entail changes in the law to allow the registrar to act quickly and react to the losses of chemistry that we have. And we do not know which compounds can replace the ones that we've lost. Sarah has said she's not going to show you any of uh, the compounds from the list that's a secret to the group. Unfortunately, I'm not bound by the secrets of the group, so I'm going to show you. And if I, there are 22 products, and if I count one, two, three, four, five, six columns, I'm going to, that means 22, 22 times six, it's something in the vicinity of more than 100. So I'm going to address each and every one of those cells individually and speak about it. I don't care about the time that Gerrit is going to limit it to. No. What I've done is I've taken six prom uh, products from the list, which we think is essential for use in horticulture. And I'm going to discuss, I'm going to mention you the six products by name, and I'm going to discuss two of them in a little bit more detail. So I'm going to spare you a lot of uh, trouble having to listen to 100 plus cells. First of all, it's dimethamorph, mancozep, propiconazole. Those are three substances which we regard as very important in horticulture. But dimethamorph R1B, reproductive toxin 1B, mancozep, reproductive toxin 1B, propiconazole, deep, uh, reproductive toxin 1B. Dimethamorph, I think, is essential for use in table grapes for the control of downy mildew, and the only replacement that we have in the slot in which dimethoate fits is copper salts. Copper salts are fine, but they have a, a potential phytotoxic risk for the table grapes. In other words, it would conflict with one of these elements of ideal crop protection strategies that I've already mentioned. 
As far as the IPM resist, uh, rating is concerned, we regard dimetamorphous fairly fine. Mancozep, stone fruit, gum spot, and leaf, sp uh, and, and leaf rust, those are two diseases for which we do not have an alternative at the moment. In the case of pears, we use Mancozep to a large extent for the control of septoria leaf rust. We could most probably uh, use Captan as an alternative. Unfortunately, Captan is not registered for any of those diseases, so it is a potential problem, unless we want to violate the law, of course. Then the IPM, friendly, uh, the IPM rating of, of Mancozep is not that great. It has an impact on natural enemies for mites and mite predators. So if we put that by the wayside, it is an important product at the moment for those two areas. There are many other areas where it's nice to have, but what, where it's not essential. But in this case, we do not have alternatives. Propiconazole, uh, it is a R1B. It's in stone fruit, where we need it for the simultaneous control of blossom blight and powdery mildew. There are many products that we can use, or there are other products that we can use for powdery mildew, and other that we can use for, for, for uh, blossom blight. But there's not a single one that can be used simultaneously that are registered, which we can use for the purpose in which propiconazole fits. And then the last three that I would like to mention to you, thiocloprid, mineral oil, and glufosinate ammonium. Unfortunately, for those who are not familiar with the names and the products, you'll have to bear with us for, the, for a little while. Thiocloprid fits in very nicely in palm fruit as the first entrance in the codling moth control strategy. There are alternatives, and I will talk about that later because I'm going to elaborate a little bit more on thiocloprid. Uh, the problem is that the alternatives have a resistant risk for, specifically for the diamides and, and the mectins, and some of them are not very effective or have long-term effects or ha doesn't have the legs to really fit into a strategy. Mineral oil, we need them with all crops, either as a dormancy breaking agent or as an adjuvant. And at the moment, we don't have alternatives for mineral oils. The problem with mineral oils are most probably some of the co-formulants or not co-formulants, some of the contaminants in there, which I believe from the, from the registration holders can be removed. So we might be able to revive mineral oil and that would be a great achievement. Then glufosinate ammonium is hardly, it's just about the only scorching agent which we can use on young trees that has a fairly acceptable environmental profile, barring the fact that it's a reproductive toxin 1B. The alternatives are glyphosate and, and uh, paraquat, and all of you would know what the concerns of the international markets are towards glyphosate and paraquat. Let's have a little bit more detailed look at the two of those six chemicals that I've mentioned, which we regard as essential. First of all, just bear in mind that all of them are 1Bs. So if we decide not to cancel the registration of the bees, we have no debate further. It's easy. But if the bees are on the list, uh, we will have a problem with the flowers, by way of speaking. The active ingredients are all 1Bs, as I said, or this active ingredient. It's used for late season control of downy mildew and table grapes past the five millimeter berry diameter stage. It's used in mixtures to support the efficacy of other active ingredients, such as amitoctradine, folpet, mancuzet. Those chemicals are absolutely essential for, for late season control of downy mildew, with the exception of folpet and mancuzet, which cannot be used post the five millimeter berry diameter because you have a problem with visible residues on table grapes, making the crop useless for, for marketing. So we are left with only one alternative, and that is a mixture of amatoctardine and, and dimethomorph, for which we have no alternative at the moment. Yes, there's a possibility of using, uh, uh, what is this thing called? Uh, Curzate Pro, or not Curzate Pro, Equation Pro, which is a mixture of amoxidone and cymoxanol. The problem with that is that formoxidone is also strike, struggling for survival and the label limits you to five millimeter berry diameter spray unless you want to ignore the gap, which will put you in the arena of illegality and the gangsters. The alternative control measures are limited to five millimeter berry diameter and I said there's a phytotoxic, the phytotoxic risk for the copper compounds that could be used instead. 
This is just an example of how the, what, the, uh, what the feature of the international markets are with regard to this specific chemical. If you look at the right-hand side of the column, you can't see much of it, but if you look at the right-hand side of the, of the little strip that I've got in there, you'll see most of it is green or yellow, which indicates that the markets don't have a real concern with it. It's acceptable chemical to the markets. So we can cross that bridge, but we have a problem with our own registration. The second one is thiocloprid. The compounds fit well into the first generation of Codling Mod Control strategy maybe the first spray after blossom. The early use of a single application will not leave residues if it is used in that regard. The manufacturer indicated that 100 days is enough to allow for total dissipation. 100 days pre-harvest pre interval is enough for total dissipation. And that's all we need. Once we can bridge that gap, we can use the product for codling moth control without any problems. Let's have a look at the alternatives. There are two diamides that could be used, cyantronilipril chlor and chlorantronilipril. Excellent products to be used. The problem is they have got a high risk for resistance. And if we overuse them, we have a problem with, uh, with obviously, we can lose two of the best compounds that we have available. Emomectin is a possibility, but emomectin is a, has got very short legs can fit in there, but it has also got a problem with residues, and we try to, or not really residues, because it's limited at 0.01, but with the necessary derogations and support behind imomectin, we can use that as an alternative for thiocloprid. Gerard, your body language hopefully is not expressing anything with regards to time. Then, the spinosins are there, but we would prefer to use them later in the season. The pyrethroids, I think, has got an acknowledged resistant level or resistant profile, and we would rather refrain from doing, using that, that instead of the thiocloprids. If you look at the market requirements again, you can do that clicking, thank you. If you look at the market requirements again, you will see it's yellows and orange. As long as it's not red and black, it's fine. The markets can tolerate. So markets can tolerate it, but we can't tolerate it. What are the impacts, of the impact of the previous slides. We have seen some highly, or we've highlighted some challenges facing production of deciduous fruit caused by these deals. Further challenges are so-called, which I would like to refer to as regulatory imperialism imposed by the regulators internationally, particularly the EU, and the proposed, or amongst others, the proposed minor clause or the mirror clause of the EU. Then further, MRL reductions by the EU is, a possible, is possible and there could be reciprocation in that regard. Then there's also com commercial imperialism due to pseudoscientific limitations of ARFDs, proportionate MRLs, the number of residues and the blacklisting of certain compounds imposed by buyers and driven by pressure groups such as consumer watchdogs. If you just have a look at, the, at this commercial compound, most of you have seen this, but just look at the German supermarkets, the requirements set by them with regards to MRLs, the summary of the sum of MRLs, the level of the MRLs, the maximum ARD, ARFD levels, and look at how it changes. Don't bother about the, the uh, up with this, this superscript and the, and the D. Just look at the figures and see how it changes between the markets. There's a big inconsistency, inconsistency between the different. They're all selling to the same Germans and uh, j maybe just in, and even in the same town. But in the end of the day, they regard themselves as whiter than driven snow from time to time. Looking back, there are more of them. Metro, Nitu, Norma, Rieva, Tigut. You can see the big variation between the different supermarkets. If that is not enough, look at the effect of a channel between two countries. Small area of the island and the, con and the continent. UK traders doesn't bother too much. They allow you 100% of the EU MRL. They have no problem with the percentage of the ARFD. They have no restrictions on the sum total of the MRL or the ARFD per sample. The, quite the contrary is true for the European supermarkets, in particular the German supermarkets. And there are more of those things which I will not dwell on. If you look at this, for instance, Look at the various restrictions of different compounds in the EU. This is just a list of the compounds to the left, 
And if you look at Aldi, Kaufland, Rewe, Lidl, Norma, Tesco, Global Fruit, uh, the Global Fruit Point is an importer on, on behalf of a number of supermarkets. You can see all the red areas in there which are prohibited chemicals. And again, uh, inconsistency between the different buyers. Okay, what can we expect in future as, as a result of these so-called deals? I think, and this is purely initiative of my own, crop losses due to limited ability of, for, of, of, and the use of active compounds, smaller and less sustainable toolbox will result or could result in, in serious crop losses. Obviously, there's a limited ability to control quarantine pests and diseases to a level of zero tolerance. Remember that a quarantine pest doesn't have a low tolerance, it has a zero tolerance. And to be able to do that almost takes more energy for the last 5% of control than for the first 95% of control. We might have a problem with secondary pests and new pests developing as a result of this. And then, of course, we'll have a problem with pest migrations. There are a lot of new pests coming into the country and which we need control measures for. A big issue with me is the generation of waste. If we fail at the number of residues internationally, or if we fail at the cosmetic compliance of the product, we waste the product. And I've seen numerous cases of growers throwing excellent quality lemons last year away. They couldn't even process them because there was oversupply in the processors because of the fact that it didn't fit one or other supermarket grill of gear. What can we expect in the future of the result of these deals? We've already started with that. We can expect monopolies in agriculture remedy marketing. If one company has the only product available in the market and he decides to sell it exclusively through a number of his agents, we will have a problem with the price and the monopolies concerned with that. We can expect a proliferation of biologic and bioregional pro biorational products and solutions, which is a good thing, but to a limit, to a point because some of these products has got a limited performance. And I'm being, I've been put on record to that I've said many of them work well when there's not a problem. Furthermore, we can expect international food, proce food processors enforcing international standards on non-export crops like wheat, barley, canola. Pioneer buys a lot of wheat. Uh, Heineken has just bought uh, one of our biggest wine sellers, Farmer's Winery. Do you think Heineken will go by the South African law or will it go by the Dutch law when it comes to residues and the, residue, uh, and the, and the restrictions imposed on barley that are being malted in Caledon? They will go by the international standards and they will be bound by the international standards. And in the end of the day, and the same will account for, for wine grapes, which up till now was almost sort of free of all these regulatory details. All of this, to my mind, could contribute and will generate food insecurity and does not support the whole aim of our international view on having more food available for a growing community. I believe the 8 million baby was born last week. The problem is not fossil fuel, it's most probably the relationship between male and females. What do we think? will be the solution to all of this. I don't know what the solution would be, but we need new thinking. If we, uh, we need effective and enabling regulatory process that are agile and supportive to all. In other words, our, in, our regulatory in authorities must be enabling, not uh, uh, regulating, but enabling. We need high-level and sound research in crop protection that can supply workable information to solve the issues of crop protection within the borders of IPM. Science must prevail. We have heard that this morning. Not pseudoscience, not perceptions. Science must prevail. We need a new focus on soil health and root management. I often say that we farm roots, we sell fruit, and we neglect the bit under, under the soil too often. We need properly trained and skilled crop protection practitioners. 
not necessarily with due, with due respect, ladies and gentlemen, salesmen. We need crop protection practitioners that can ensure that South African agriculture stays in business. And this is most probably one of the most important bits as far as I'm concerned. We need harmonious, continuous harmonious relationships and discussions between the authorities, organized agriculture, and the trade to solve challenges quickly and cost efficiently. Pseudo science, red tape, egos, would, is bound to kill our agriculture and cause irreparable damage to the economy and food safety. I want to conclude with a statement made by a great orator many years ago, and almost to the day, 80 years ago, where he said, this is not the end. Maybe this is not even the beginning of the end, but maybe this is the end of the beginning. And it was Winston Churchill who said that 10th November 1942. I think to a large extent it would apply to us as well. This could be the beginning or the end of the, the beginning of the end. No, it could be rather the beginning. Let's leave it to Churchill to dwell with that. Thank you very much, Gerard. <laughs>